I'll be talking about surgery for prostate cancer and just going over a little bit of uh, localized disease and locally advanced disease. Uh, and when you look at uh, radical prostatectomy, a lot of us are actually, I was pretty surprised to know that the first uh, prostatectomy was probably done in India around 1500 BC, or that's what the folklore says, by a gentleman called uh, Dr. Sushrut, uh, who is considered the founding father of surgery. But of course, he didn't have a robot at that time, and I'm sure things would have been pretty difficult uh, without anesthesia and antibiotics as well. Now, if you look at uh, the uh, really the role of surgery and where it stands in terms of localized prostate cancer, I think these are the three biggies that you've got to know. You have to know about these three top trials because this is what is going to be probably helpful for, to you in your exams, uh, in your presentations, and also it will help you, you know, kind of look smart and intelligent in conferences, maybe land up a fellowship with uh, Wish or, or Bhavan there. Uh, I think one of the top three trials is the PIVOT trial, which of course uh, compared observation versus radical prostatectomy for early prostate cancer. This was in the late uh, 1990s and early 2000s, about 700 plus patients randomized into these two arms. And it was found that there isn't any difference in terms of overall survival or cancer-specific survival if you did observation or radical prostatectomy. However, over prolonged follow-up, more than 20 years or so, it was found that patients who actually had intermediate risk disease were patients who were benefiting in terms of having a better overall survival with radical prostatectomy as compared to observation. So there may be a subgroup of patients where radical prostatectomy makes a lot of sense, and that subgroup probably is not low-risk disease. This is this is was a little bit improved upon by another trial, which was the Scandinavian Prostate Cancer Group 4, SPCG4 trial, which was also published in 2014. It showed that overall, in all patients who underwent radical prostatectomy versus watchful waiting, there was about a 30% improvement in overall survival with radical prostatectomy, about a 44% improvement in cancer-specific survival with a number needed to treat of one in eight. So if you operated eight patients, one of them would have a survival benefit. In this study, it was also found that the maximum impact was probably in those patients who were less than 65 years of age and who had intermediate risk disease. But all the patients actually benefited, benefited from it. Here you can see that if you look at these, this darkest uh, shaded area, this is the prostate cancer specific mortality. And if you look at this entire graph, you would find that the maximum difference between the patients who undergo radical prostatectomy versus the patients who undergo watchful waiting is in the intermediate risk groups. These are the patients who are really being impacted with surgery. In this uh, particular study, which has been talked about, the PROTECT trial, again, these three modalities were compared, active, active monitoring, surgery, or radiation therapy, no difference in prostate cancer specific survival at a follow-up of 10 years, but definite improvement in terms of freedom from disease progression and decrease in, decrease in the rate of metastasis in those patients who underwent either radiation therapy or surgery rather than active surveillance for these patients. Now, one of the factors that's very important to note is about 70% of these patients who, had, um, who were enrolled in this trial, which was a total of about 1,600 patients, about 70% were actually low risk disease. So it does seem that whether you actually do something or you don't do anything for low risk disease, it doesn't really matter too much. And as uh, Vish said, I think we are really looking at trying to find the, the wolf in a flock of sheep here. However, I would like to tell you that the data that we see in the West and the publications that have emerged from it and what is actually happening in India are, are maybe two complete different ball games. Uh, now, you know, this gentleman here who's riding two bikes at the same time and all three of them are without a helmet, I think this not wearing a helmet seems to be the least of his problems. And there are other aspects of his anatomy which are at greater long-term risk by this kind of an activity. Uh, if you look at what's happening in India, uh, things are actually pretty different from what is are there in the West. Out of all the 600 odd robotic prostatectomies that we have done over the last few years, we found that more than 50% of the patients actually have high risk disease and about 30, 40% have low risk disease. In fact, the incidence of 
uh, radical prostate, uh, low risk disease in the radical prostatectomy patients that we have operated are actually less than 10%. So 8.1% to be precise. And this is a publication that we had, that we made recently in the Indian Journal of Urology. We looked at our data of 567 robotic prostatectomies till 2019. Only 46 of them were actually low risk preoperatively. And even amongst these 46 patients, 50% of these patients were upgraded to ISUP grade two or more. And about 18% of these patients actually had extra prostatic disease. And some of them were even found to be seminal vesicle positive. So the low risk of UK or the low risk of, of, of the West or the US may not be the same as the low risk of India. Now let's head a little bit towards the locally advanced disease, which is a more common form of disease, unfortunately, that we are seeing in our patients who are candidates for any kind of a treatment. High risk patients are, uh, have different surgical and non-surgical options. And of course, uh, Dr. Rob Chandler has very beautifully talked about the options. And I was really impressed by the way he objectively compared surgery versus radiation Pretty much what I would, I would have said when I'm comparing these two different sets of uh, uh, options available. So like we say, you know, in patients who've got high risk disease, you have options of radiation therapy plus hormonal therapy, and you have the option of radical prostatectomy as well, particularly for selected patients. Now there is some data available, um, which actually says that uh, radical prostatectomy may be a better option in these patients. It's retrospective, it's a very low level of evidence. It's full of biases, but it is there. And I would think that you know there, there are some papers which say that you're actually having a better overall survival and better cancer specific survival with surgery. And I am sure this is what the radiation oncologist will react. Uh, this is the way that he will react if we show him his data and he's perfectly justified. I'm sure uh, Rob would be feeling the same by seeing this data because this is heavily biased. I completely accept that where the best patients, the young patients, the patients with minimal comorbidities are actually taken up for surgery, whereas the older and the sicker gentlemen undergo radiation therapy. But at the very least, it makes us uh, realize that we have to consider both these options with a big dose of equipoise. I think both these options are available. There are pros and cons of each option. And in fact, going forward, high-risk prostate cancer and radiation and uh, locally advanced prostate cancer may probably best be treated by a combination of radiation therapy and radical prostatectomy with radical prostatectomy being the upfront option and radiation therapy being the secondary option once the surgery has been performed. And in fact, there is some evidence to suggest, again, it's retrospective, but there is some evidence to suggest that these patients may actually have better outcomes, even in terms of survival, if they undergo radical prostatectomy followed by radiation therapy rather than radiation plus androgen deprivation alone. And there is positive impact both on uh, cancer specific survival and overall survival. At the very least, by sequencing the procedures with surgery being followed by radiation therapy, you definitely have better outcomes in terms of incontinence and also on in terms of erectile dysfunction. And the reason for that is pretty clear Firstly, you are avoiding a high dose radiation as the primary treatment, uh, resulting in less bowel dysfunction, risk, less chance of proctitis. You're giving a lower dose of radiation therapy when you're giving it in an adjuvant or salvage setting. And also, if you're doing, doing surgery first in a virgin field, the chances of having any complications related to a surgical difficulty are much lesser rather than operating in an irradiated field after radiation therapy. So the potential advantage of radical prostatectomy would be that it provides you with a definitive staging. Uh, you know exactly what the stage is, what, what is the status of the lymph nodes, what is the status of the extra prostatic extension. Uh, there is an improved PSA sensitivity. So with ultra sensitive PSA being available, you can actually fine tune the need for adjuvant therapy. It's not as if you have to give radiation therapy to everybody and with recent data coming in from radicals and raves, it, just, it does seem that you can actually select which patients actually require radiation therapy by giving them early salvage after surgery rather than giving an adjuvant radiation to everybody. There may be a decreased need for androgen deprivation therapy and may provide better local control and decrease long-term morbidity in terms of uh, the chances of local recurrence, 
the need for catheterizations, repeated channel TURs, PCNs, and, uh, and a lot of other problems. One of the things which radiation oncologists almost never tell a patient who's coming in for prostate cancer radiotherapy is the increased chance of getting uh, bladder cancer. Now, it's not a lot, but it's still significantly higher than patients who have never been irradiated. And you know, this is something which this may be a little red devil hiding under the carpet where, oh, there, there will be no problems after radiation. But you know, I wonder how many patients would undergo radiation for prostate if they knew that it could cause bladder cancer. Well, the um, coming on to the role of surgery for lymph node positive disease, uh, it's pretty surprising, but even a lymph node positive, which is a stage three disease, uh, for prostate cancer has pretty good outcomes. And those patients who have undergone surgery alone with extended pelvic lymph node dissection, their 10-year survival is actually 72%, which is, which is pretty good uh, as compared to other malignancies. So potentially you have a very long period of time when these patients can receive additional treatments and with new medications, new treatments, new techniques coming in all the time, we can hopefully increase the survival even more for these you know, relatively advanced disease states. Uh, even amongst these patients, you can actually select those patients who require additional treatment. Now in the same study that, that I'm quoting, uh, those patients who have only a single lymph node positive disease or two lymph node positive disease on uh, extended pelvic lymph node dissection, they end up having about a 20 to 40% chance of not requiring any further treatment and can potentially be cured by surgery alone. So these patients may not even require androgen deprivation therapy in the long term. Uh, we have looked at our own set of data. Uh, more than 20% of the patients that we operate, unfortunately, are lymph node positive. So we have uh, submitted uh, Ashwin Tamhankar, our ex-fellow who worked uh, for, for a year in the UK, uh, actually has written this paper and we've submitted this for publication. We looked at 100 patients who were lymph node positive, who were managed without any adjuvant treatment. And we found that those patients who were only one or two lymph node positive, even after about five years, about 25% of them didn't require any additional treatment, including androgen deprivation therapy. In fact, Ashwin has made a very nice uh, analysis using PSA, using a tumor volume in the, in the prostate and also looking at the lymph node density to create a kind of a nomogram which divides these patients into low, intermediate and high risk group, not to be confused with the D'Amico classification. Uh, and by, by looking at these three parameters, one is able to actually figure out that who are the patients who are likely to need treatment even if they are lymph node positive and who which patients can be observed safely over a period of time. In the low risk group, in fact, about 50% of these patients actually were free of biochemical recurrence without any additional treatment if they had only one or two positive lymph nodes and even in the long term did not require any additional treatment. So with that, I'll just quickly round up uh, regarding our own data. The reason for presenting this data is to actually uh, explore the real world situation of radical prostatectomy patients who in, in our country it may be a lot different than, than what, we, what the publications we see coming in from the West where PSA screening has been the norm for, for, for a couple of decades before now, uh, it going a little bit out of fashion. Uh, we, we do about 100 robotic prostatectomies a year. Uh, you know, we, we were also hit hard by COVID. We did, we've done only 34 this year, but hopefully now things are picking up and we'll be able to catch up. Uh, the... Uh, if out of the 612 odd patients that we operate, 27% of these patients are actually lymph node positive. So that's more than one in four. And only less than 40% of the patients are organ confined. So 60% of radical prostatectomies are either lymph node positive or have extra prostatic extension or seminal vesicle involvement. The rates of biochemical recurrence obviously will be much higher than what we see in the West. Uh, we have about a 50% chance of biochemical recurrence in patients with a high risk disease. It goes down to almost 0% at the low risk disease. About one in four patients with intermediate risk will recur. And all these are short term uh, follow ups. In over the long term, probably these rates will be higher. So, a lot of patients post operatively will require radiation therapy and adjuvant treatment in our setup. 
uh, continence rates, 84% continence at uh, 12 months. The progression is pretty okay, but I would expect this to be around 95% in the West. Why are we having a 10% lower continence rate? Maybe again, because we are operating in relatively advanced disease where the chances of doing a nerve preservation, bladder neck preservation, you know, a very close apical dissection are probably lower than what we do in the low risk disease. Uh, this, these are, you know, unfortunately, a very small percentage of patients in India are sexually active before surgery. Um, a lot of them need adjuvant treatment after radical prostatectomy. So these patients, these are the, this analysis is only for those patients who have completely normal preoperative sexual function without any PDE5 inhibitors and who have undergone a bilateral nerve sparing surgery and have not required any adjuvant treatment. With a bilateral nerve spare, we have about a two in three potency rate at about one year. Uh, these, are, these are our complication rates, uh, intraoperative complications. Fortunately, none of them were serious complications. Uh, we, had, we have about a 0.9% intraoperative complications. Post-op complications as rates are about 7.5%, but fortunately, most of them are not really serious. They are invariably Clavian, uh, Dindo 1 or 2 uh, problems. And uh, re-exploration has happened only twice, one for bleeding and one for a port site herniation. Uh, we don't have a 30-day mortality yet, and I hope that's the way it remains. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude uh, again with uh, gratitude for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this magnificent platform. Thank you, Bhavan.